This is High School Not So Much a Musical, a podcast that takes you on a ride to the peaks and valleys of a high school journey. Here are your presenters, Nitin Jaladanki and Ayush Agarwal. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to High School Not So Much Musical. This is part two uh, for our podcast with Dr. Amit Sinha. Uh, this podcast, I'll start it off with a couple of questions. So, uh, Dr. Sinha, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, you talked about your first initial startup venture with uh, your thesis advisor and some other uh, some other of your friends. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, that was a tumultuous time to start a business due to number one, 9-11, but number two uh, was the dot-com bubble, which for the listeners is essentially where uh, at the start of the 20, 21st century, uh, due to how rapidly tech was expanding in the prior decade, a lot of like tech stocks essentially got overvalued and then that value pretty much entirely collapsed at, at the beginning of the 21st century, causing the dot-com bubble. So. Uh, what was your experience like trying to create um, a business while the dot-com bubble was actively occurring? Like, was it difficult to garner investment into your business? Was it difficult to, you know, get employees, etc.? Yeah, so um, it was a particularly tough time uh, if you were graduating. Um, I think given the dot-com correction, many of the, uh, many of the, startups had folded, uh, you know, kind of existing businesses had hiring freezes. Um, and, uh, you know, whenever you get into a downturn like that, uh, just kind of the availability of jobs shrinks. Uh, if you're trying to, uh, trying to fund a startup, not many investors uh, are willing to take the risk. Um, but having said that, you know, there'll always be an appetite uh, for uh, for for smart, uh, you know, driven people who are uh, who are trying to change the status quo. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, in in part one, we ended up raising uh, about forty two million, uh, you know, even during those times through uh, Bessemer Ventures and Matrix Partners, and it was largely because of uh, uh, the capability of the team that we had assembled. Uh, you know, we had uh, about a dozen people from MIT. We had uh, a bunch of engineers from Harvard. Uh, we had uh, a couple of faculty members uh, join us. Uh, uh, you know, Ananta Chandrakasan, uh, Professor Anand Agarwal, uh, and, and a few others. And so, um, investors look uh, primarily uh, at uh, at the team and uh, broadly, you know, the the area. Uh, is it a is it a big enough uh, addressable market and um, is the team capable of uh, delivering a solution that can uh, that can capitalize on the opportunity? So it was a tough time, but uh, I think we assembled a good team and uh, we ended up uh, uh, raising money and kicking off engine. So I think that this get, leads me directly into the next question, which is, so you obviously went through this really hard time of creating your business. But what are what do you think are some of the biggest cybersecurity threats right now at this time, where teenagers should be looking? What teenagers should be looking for when they're browsing the internet, and what they can do to prevent themselves from downloading malicious malware? Because now that everything is online, and because we're always on school with online with Schoology and everything like that, we're always looking for the next new thing to do online, whether it be an online game or anything like that. And there's so many stories of even these amateur hackers or even kids who didn't even mean to hack into like these big companies, they just directly hack into them because they're just doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So just to reset again, what are some of the biggest cybersecurity threats? What should teenagers look when they're browsing the internet and how do they prevent themselves from downloading malicious malware? That's a good question, Nathan. And I think we touched upon some of this in part one um, and share a few more uh, pointers here. Uh, one, I mean, you've all heard about things like ransomware or, you know, your identity being compromised. Uh, you know, you, you, you hear about uh, data loss and, you know, breaches costing business millions of dollars or ransomware just crippling them. Uh, but as, as kids, uh, you know, maybe I'd start off with, uh, uh, with you know, how a, 
typical attack happens in the, in the, in the cybersecurity world, it's called a kill chain. And what a kill chain is, is the steps that a hacker takes uh, to uh, get to uh, their objectives. And typically it starts with uh, what is called reconnaissance. And what's reconnaissance? Let's say, Nitin, I want to uh, get into your laptop. Uh, reconnaissance starts off with looking at your social media feeds and who you're friends with and what type of stuff are you into and, and maybe a little more information like, hey, do you use a Mac or a Windows machine or things like that. So once I have a understanding of what your interests are, uh, uh, you know, the second step in a cyber kill chain is, uh, is uh, getting that initial uh, payload uh, delivered, right? That uh, that'll that'll start the attack, and it's typically done through a some sort of a targeted phishing attack, right? Um, I could send you an email or a or a message or something that you're highly likely to click on based on the reconnaissance activity I've done on you, right? So uh, maybe you're interested in something, and uh, you get an email that looks legit, and uh, and you know you click on it, and that that click results in uh, the initial infection because I knew you were using a say a Windows machine that uh, wasn't uh, patched and uh, and uh, you know you're interested in uh, you know say buying something based on what you posted recently and and and, and uh, combining all of that uh, increases the my my odds that I can get into your machine. Um, so step one, you know, I think don't post too much stuff on the internet, right? Don't let people know unnecessary things outside your core network. Um, you know, be very careful of uh, what you click on. If it looks fishy, it probably is. Uh, you know, and keep your systems always patched and up to date. Uh, we talked about, you know, using a password manager. Don't use the same password, um, you know, and for your core accounts, Gmail, like Cloud, etc., use you know, multiple factors um, and, uh, and just, uh, you know, always be aware. So uh, that will make sure that uh, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, despite all the, all your activity being online, you know, you're still, still secure. And some of the other things, uh, you know, maybe your parents can uh, lock down your, uh, uh, your, um, you know, credit accounts. Uh, there are ways to do it. Right. If you're under 18, you could put a freeze on your social security and related credit information so uh, people don't open unauthorized accounts in your name uh, because uh, you know it's possible, for example, that your your information, your date of birth, your social security number, your uh, your other account information was available with say your doctor's office and they got hacked and all that information is now. Uh, available in, on the dark web for someone to buy. Uh, so you want to kind of freeze your accounts uh, because you know you, it's not like you're going to you know uh, uh, open up a home mortgage account anytime soon. So why keep it uh, uh, in a in an active state? So uh, that would be another thing that perhaps your parents could do. Okay, so thank you for that. Like now you talked about what are the biggest threats nowadays that teenagers should look for. And you're currently working in Zscaler and you talked about Zscaler a little bit in your introduction in part one, but can you go more in depth into what Zscaler does to help prevent people from getting like these viruses, scams and downloading like malicious malware? Like what does Zscaler prov provide for their customers? Yeah, that's a great question, Rishi. Um, so in, in part one, we, we briefly touched upon Zscaler sitting as a, uh, so think of it as a sort of a, concierge service in between uh, our, our empl customers, employees, and their destination. So maybe I'll start off with a simple analogy. I'm sure all of you get a lot of uh, spam calls on your phone, right? Uh, why is that? Well, that's because your number is out there and anyone can, can dial your number and you, know, you see uh, it coming and you probably don't recognize the number. Um, what Zscaler does is uh, step one, you know, we kind of eliminate that attack surface. So all, uh, say, 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 say our customer has 100,000 employees, all their employees come to Zscaler and the rest of the internet just sees Zscaler. So they don't know who's behind and uh, you know, kind of, it becomes like a concierge service. Uh, that would be similar to instead of you publishing your number to your friends and everyone 
on the internet, uh, there's a concierge. Uh, let's say Nitin wants to talk to Rishi. Nitin calls a concierge service and uh, says, hey, I need to talk to Rishi. And Rishi could have a policy set up that says, well, I, I will allow a phone call with Nitin or I won't. And, uh, you know, Nitin never has to know Rishi's phone number and Rishi will never get an unknown spam call. Um, so, you know, step one, think of us, uh, Zscaler, as sitting in between, uh, between businesses and their destinations. And so the attack surface visible on the internet is just eliminated because the rest of the internet uh, sees only Zscaler. They don't know who's behind. And businesses set up their policy that says, hey, these employees are allowed to talk to these destinations and uh, those destinations only see Zscaler because we are uh, what you would call a proxy sitting in between uh, between uh, the two communicating parties. Uh, the second thing that we do is, um, you know, we, we, we establish connectivity based on, uh, you know, strong identity, context and content. So what does that mean? There's a bunch of words that I threw there. Um, so once you come, once you come to Zscaler, like going back to that phone analogy, identity would mean Nitin tells the concierge, I am Nitin and here's proof. Uh, context uh, would mean, well, uh, maybe Rishi, you want to get calls, you know, during the day and not at night. So the context might be, well, it's nighttime. And while Nitin is Nitin, do I need to allow that call through? And content, uh, you know, in this case, could mean, uh, well, Nitin has an emergency. So you know, here's the content of what he wants to do. And based on all of those three, the call is allowed or not. So translate the same thing into what you do on the internet. So Zscaler sitting in between, you know, our customers, their employees are coming to us and they, based on that identity, context, content, you know, we allow uh, uh, connections to where they want to go. And um, as part of that, we're inspecting. For example, let's say you click on a link and it was a phishing link, it would get blocked. Or you try to download um, something from a Google Drive link and uh, it was a shared Google Drive link that someone sent you. Maybe it had a, a virus in it, right? Maybe it had a, a file, a PDF or some other uh, file that had some embedded uh, virus. Uh, how do you? How do you make sure that uh, that didn't go through and infect uh, the user's machine? So Zscaler is sitting in between. We're at very high speed, able to scan the content and say, well, this is this is an allowed transaction. And uh, well, based on content, even though it was allowed, uh, we see something fishy or malicious or, or potentially malware and we'll block it. So by sitting in between, we are able to enforce these business policies and reduce the attack surface, and also uh, make sure that uh, nothing you know bad is coming in by inspecting the content of uh, of uh, the payload in those transactions. And um, um, the other thing I'd say is you know you also want to prevent data loss, right? So maybe let's say um, you know you you set up a shared Google Drive folder or Dropbox folder, and you put in a bunch of content in it without realizing that it had sensitive or confidential information, you wouldn't want that to leak out right to the internet. Um, because we're sitting in between, we are able to enforce those policies as well. And you know, we can scan content and say, hey, this is confidential information for the company, or this has you know, healthcare records or account numbers that shouldn't leak out, or this is source code that has intellectual property and, and uh, it should not leak out or go to unsanctioned destinations on the internet. So by sitting in between at a high level, we're making sure nothing bad comes in, nothing good leaks out. And we, we're, you know, we're an exchange that is uh, in, enforcing connectivity between uh, users and destinations based on business policies uh, that are dynamically enforced uh, with identity, context, and content. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it really clears up like a lot about what your company is doing and like why it's so crucial nowadays, especially because everything is digitalized. So we're coming to an end of part two. And um, the last question we have for you is the staple of our podcast. It's called the tips question. 
So I'm just asking you if you could give any advice to the high schoolers or the listeners in general. Um, it, like, just give any advice. It could be about anything. It could be about cybersecurity. It could be about colleges, etc. So, just if you could give any advice to the listeners, what would it be? <laughs> that's a it's a loaded question. Um, well, look, when I went to college, times were different, so I won't uh, claim to understand uh, all the uh, the complexity. Uh, of uh, of colleges and careers that uh, uh, many of the high school students face. Uh, when when I was growing up, for example, uh, there's no internet, there's no phone. Uh, you know, you had limited teachers, and uh, but one of the advantages of that was, uh, you know, um, you you really uh, you really put in effort and struggled a bit, right? So, for example, if you had a hard math problem and you know, I would struggle and, and, and try to do it for hours uh, because the, you couldn't just Google the answer or call someone and, you know, get, get the answer. Um, and what happens is when you, when you do something uh, on your own, it really sticks with you and you remember. And, uh, you know, when, I, I, when, I, when I'm helping my kids out, uh, they'll often ask me, well, how do you know all of this and how do you remember this? And uh, it's because, uh, because uh, you know, I struggled uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with it, right? So, you know, if you fast forward to today, um, it's, uh, you know, it's access to information and content is not a problem. Like uh, when, when we were growing up, to do well, you need two things. You needed to have access to information and you needed to have the willingness and the desire to use it and, and learn. Now every, it's an even playing field, right? Everyone has access to the same information, maybe an overwhelming amount of information. So it boils down to uh, really, are you passionate about it? Are you passionate about learning and, 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 and figuring it out? And you know, uh, now there's so much information that frankly, what college you go to, you go to doesn't really matter because everyone has access to all the information. So it, it boils down to, uh, you know, what is it that you're really passionate about? And uh, if, if, uh, if, you're, if you're excited about something, if you care about it deeply, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, everything will just work out. You know, you'll, uh, uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot. It won't feel like a lot of work. Uh, you'll get up excited every day about it. Uh, you know, you'll do well in school and college because you're really excited about it and uh, it will, uh, uh, you know, lead to better job satisfaction when you start working on it. So uh, my, my advice would be, uh, you know, uh, be passionate about what you do and, uh, you know, everything else, uh, you know, uh, happiness and money and, and, uh, and just, uh, you know, just, uh, excitement about living a full life will just follow. Dr. Sinha, for all the advice on life, cybersecurity, tech, education, etc. Uh, we really enjoyed this podcast um, for our listeners. We have a lot of great content coming up soon. We'll be talking with uh, the world's strongest bodybuilder and we'll also be talking with uh, a couple actors and also a British detective. So Make sure to watch out for those episodes coming soon. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. I really enjoyed the podcast. Nitin, Ayush, and Rishi, well done. And I look forward to some of the exciting other podcasts you just mentioned. Thank you. That's our show for today. Now roll the credits. High School Not So Much a Musical is hosted by Ayush Agarwal, Nitin Jaladanki, and Rishi Sinha. Narration by Samhit Padala. Music from Louis Luang Relaxation Cafe, Tune Pocket, and Infraction. If you like the show, please recommend it to your friends and family. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.